Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Green. Well, if you need a handout tonight on what is church, if you'd raise your hand. If you maybe you didn't get one when you came in or got one last week. And if you would, Brother and Cecil, if you could bring me one as well so I know what I'm teaching tonight. Uh, no, I have my notes here, but I have to remember the blanks I give you. I am notorious for skipping blanks. And I can be giving you, I give you a sheet of blanks, and I can go right along and miss that, and that will absolutely unsettle your universe if I skip over one of your blanks. You won't be able to go any further in life, and so I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And so, uh, if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, hold that hand up. If you need, I think, brothers, see so some teens over here need one. And Darlene in the back over there, they're getting them. Thank you so much, man, for helping us pass uh, those things out. Appreciate all the help here at First Baptist Church. So many people willing to give themselves, and I'm in a tremendous church. You're in a tremendous church, and I'm glad to serve here. What is church? That's what we're looking at. Looking at it from God's Word, and then some elements of what makes up a church. We know that church is not our idea, our invention, but God's idea and His plan for a body, a local body of believers we call the church. Last week and tonight, we'll continue looking at some elements of a local church. What makes up a church as opposed to just a gathering? All right, why do we call the church as opposed to just a fellowship or something else? Can you have a church with two people? Or do you have to have a certain number? Some elements of a local church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Look at this passage each week as we've looked at this concept, what is church? Let's ask the Lord's blessing and help on the service tonight. Lord, I thank you for helping us as we're here or as we sing and worship you. What I pray now is as we look at your word and some concepts about church that you would open our hearts. It would help me to communicate, communicate these truths clearly and in a way that would be profitable and helpful. And Lord, help our minds to be in tune to your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I've shared these last few weeks how church is under attack from without and from within. I don't believe it will get any better in the United States of America. I wish it would. I wish we could say yes with confidence. It'll be easier to have church and there'll be less restrictions and less uh, mocking in the public square. But I don't think that'll be the case. I believe that if history shows that the longer we go, the more that we'll be ridiculed, the more oppressed we will be as we follow the Lord and follow what we believe He teaches us. There's attack from without on the church, and we've already seen some of those attacks. We've seen rulings from courts that, that state that churches have no, in some sense, special dispensation. They've been shown already ruled on a Supreme Court level that they can be arbitrary in their numbers of churches, and whether you are a casino, that may be acceptable, but a church is not. And sure, along the way, there are a few wins for the church and religious body of Christ. But I don't think that it's going to get any much better, and there will always be attack from without. Jesus said that. He said, in essence, don't be surprised if the world hates you because they hated me first. So we should not be surprised if we're looked at as odd, as weird, as wing nuts. Follow of Jesus Christ can be thought to be a little bit strange, but make sure you're strange because of your faith in God. Right, not just because you're a weirdo. Churches are an attack from without. Boy, that could be a sermon all by itself, could it not be? <laughs> ah, Brother Kemp, that's tremendous. <laughs> no. And uh, they're an attack from within. We're seeing that. Um, I tend to watch articles and in different publications from pastors and religious leaders in, across the nation. And uh, there's seldom a day that goes by that I don't read something and shake my head in utter amazement. How can this professing pastor, professing religious leader, say something like this? Switch something like this that where maybe they were on this path that we would agree with and then a complete 180. Or they come out with just the strangest statements. I told you about a few of them, but, but one recently came out and, and they're just excited because they're going to begin to have services on Sunday night. And they're going to, he's going to teach through the Bible. 
section by section. Wow, what a novel idea. As a New Year resolution. Boy, we meet three times a week. Did you know this? I've been uh, working on my, my message for stewardship Sunday and the stewardship banquet. Did you know that people who go to church more are more likely to give to church? Found this out. Wow. Just so you know, the more you come, the more you may give to First Baptist Church. Now, it's not, they say, it's not, I believe, because of a guilt trip. My Bible says, for your treasure is there where your heart be also. And vice versa, where your heart is there where your treasure will be also. All right, I think those concepts are, are, go right together. And, and when you invest in something with your time and energy, your pocketbook tends to follow as well. You know, the people who go to church just one time a week are the least likely to give to church. This is not just in Baptist, this is across the board. Well, believe it or not, we believe in church here. Church is attacked from within and without. But Jesus said the church will not be stopped. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of God cannot be stopped. Now, this church could be shut down. The government could come in and say, listen, we're going to bar your doors, we'll arrest all of you and throw all of us in prison. I don't see that happening, but they could, right? This particular assembly could be like this, but God's church will never be stopped. The gospel will be powerful. It will continue to grow, and though we would be forbidden and, and maybe could not meet in the same building, we, we would still, in a way, have be part of the church of Christ in the universal sense, but also maybe we'd start a hundred or more churches then. God's church cannot be stopped. On your sheet, we have some elements of a local church. The first we looked at last week, preaching and teaching at a fundamental level. We must not only proclaim the truth, preach, but also instruct the way, teach. To help fill in your blanks there in case you don't have your sheet from last week, the first one, not a blank, but it says Paul did both. Paul taught and he preached. The early Christians, the early Christians did both, and daily in the temple, in every house they ceased not to teach and preach, evangelize Jesus Christ. Timothy, Timothy, a spiritual son to Paul, was instructed by Paul to do both. Paul did both. Or the Christians did both. Timothy was instructed to do both. And Jesus, your next page, the first blank there, Jesus did, the, did both. Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So those two definitions, the first blank there, preaching. Proclaiming the truth with, a, with passion, with a purpose of confrontation and change. I will not go through this completely again, but in case you want to see an example, go back last week, watch the YouTube video, and, I'll, and I will preach about cell phones, Facebook, confrontation with an expectation of change. Got a few texts about that. A few texts about that last week. And, uh, uh, and even some encouragement to continue on that. It seems as if some of you as members of First Baptist Church have noticed what I notice and are like, they ought to put their phones away during the song service. Help us. Say, oh, the pastor helps me sing better to read my texts. Hmm. But I'm not going to go to example again of preaching, all right? Go back and watch the video from last week. Teaching the next blank, instruction of truth with, a passion, with passion, with a purpose of obedience and growth. Jesus said this in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And understand that it's not just preaching that has an expectation of change. Teaching and preaching both have an expectation of change. When Jesus said to go and teach all nations he then said baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching again that word them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world amen the sermon ought to be proclaimed with passion for confrontation change obedience and growth and then on that next page we looked at prayer last week prayer an element of the local church 
found in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. They, then they, they gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Three uh, ways we pray in a New Testament church. One, we pray for needs. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. It is okay. It is encouraged. We are allowed to pray for our requests. It's not just selfish. Lord, I'm asking you to do this. Lord, I'm all right with what you decide. I'm content in whatever state that you put me in or leave me in or take me in or bring me in. I'll be content. But, Lord, I'm asking that you do this. You see that with Paul. He had a thorn in the flesh, and three times, the Bible says, he besought the Lord to remove the thorn in his side, in the flesh. Three times. And God said, no. But he gave a greater yes. He said, I'm not going to remove this, not because I don't like you, Paul. And that's kind of what we think. Well, obviously, uh, God doesn't like me. He likes them more. He'd do that for me. Or because Paul wasn't good enough, that's what we also we think this. Well, if I was a better Christian, then God would answer this the way I want it to be. But Jesus said, no, Paul, I'm going to leave this here, but my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, Paul, what you're going to get instead, the yes I will give you, is my power. That's why Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ, the power of Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to say no to what you're asking, but I'm going to give you something a whole lot better than this hurts. We can ask for our requests, for our needs. We can ask for healing, pray for healing. The second blank there. James chapter 5 tells us that if someone is sick, we are to pray for them and pray in faith that God will heal them. Does God always heal someone? No, he doesn't. Sometimes he takes that person home to glory. No matter how much we've prayed, does God sometimes heal them? Absolutely. That's what the Bible says. The prayer of faith shall save them. Save the sick. Third blank there, we can pray for others. So Paul did. Continue now. This is some new material now as we look at this. What else is the part of the, first, uh, the New Testament church? The next big, bold word there is giving. Now, we're in the middle of Stewardship Month, but I want to talk about giving. Giving is a part of the church. Not my idea. I'm not here. Uh, I talked last week or two weeks ago about uh, how I don't ask for money on our television broadcast. All right? I don't preach much on money. I'm not afraid of preaching on money. As the time comes, we'll preach on it. I'm, not, I'm okay with that. But as I read my Bible, there's some giving in a church. Now, some people say, well, I don't like to hear about money when I come to church. I'm sorry. It's in the Bible. If we decide that, what else do you want to line item veto out of your Bible? Well, as long as you're asking, there's a few that I want to line item veto. Some of you ladies want to line item veto respecting and reverencing your husband. You know, today we're crossing this off. Some of you men sometimes want to line item veto loving your wife like Christ loved the church. That's a high expectation. There's a lot of things we would like to, at times, veto, line item, cross right out of God's Word. We're not allowed to. Look at the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints. That sounds like an offering, doesn't it? The collection for whom? The saints. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Paul says we're going to talk about collecting some money. And I'm going to tell you the same thing that I told the churches over here. So you in Galatia and you in Corinth are going to have the same kind of offerings. Here's my instruction. Remember, under the Spirit of God. 
Not just Paul talking. This is under the Spirit of God. What does he say? Verse number two. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul, as a missionary, would travel around to these churches. We find the record of his missionary journeys in the book of Acts. He'd go city to city and eventually make it back and, and, uh, to each or all the cities that we know about, and he'd teach there. But in the meantime, he'd write some letters, and he says, Listen, while I'm gone, take the offerings on the first day of every single week. So that when I come, there's not a big problem, not a big thing to do. It's already been done every single week. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul's talking to the same churches, the church of Corinth. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto their riches of their liberality. Offering. Let me give you a couple of thoughts about the offering on, from these verses. So number one, it ought to be taken regularly. Taken regularly. Word consistent. So there's no gatherings when I come. Taken regularly. Does that mean that we have to have an offering every single service? Do we have to? We don't have to. But it ought to be taken regularly. Do we have to even pass plates? No, we don't have to. In fact, some churches do it differently. Some churches will put bags or a box in the back of the auditorium. So why do we at First Baptist Church pass some plates around? Well, we got to find a job for Brother Mitchell and uh, couldn't sing in the choir, so that was crossed out. And um, boy, uh, couldn't play the piano, so that one was out. And well, we found out if we gave him a plate, he could pass that. Is that why, Brother Mitchell? No, of course not. Well, never mind. Maybe it is. No. We do certain things with the offering to make it easy for people to give. Right? That's why we have the, the little envelopes inside the, uh, inside the back of the, the pews, why the plates come down the aisles, so that it's easy. You don't have to work too hard. It's why we also offer online giving. Make it easy for people. In one sense, many people want to give. Or they want to give, but any kind of block, and they'll be like, oh, okay, can't do it. So nothing in the Bible says you have to only give online or not online, check or credit card or whatever. And some people say, well, bless God, I'll never give my credit card. I'll only give by check. And that's fine if you believe that. And I'm not using that newfangled online push pay. That's, uh, that's you know, that's obviously uh, not of God. And no, 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 no. We want to take it regularly, though, every week. And the second thought is, taken seriously so that we're careful. The two words, the two C's there, if you want to alliterate it, consistent and careful, they're in your notes. Taken seriously. It is, it is to be used on purpose. That's what Paul said. This is a collection for the saints. I believe just like you are a steward and I am a steward of what God has given to me personally and my family, my wife and I, that what God has given to the church is to be taken and used in a serious manner. As your pastor, all right, and the pastor of this church, I have from the church and from the deacons the authority to spend the money the way that I believe we ought to spend it. But I do not take that responsibility lightly. I view it, and this is, I'm just giving, open up my heart and telling you how, how I view this. All right, I view all of this money as, first of all, God's. Every dime given is God's money. And then I view it to be given sacrificially. I know of no one at First Baptist Church who is so wealthy... Though we have some wealthy people here, I know of no one here who is so wealthy that if they did not give, they would spend that money. They wouldn't have any other way to spend the money. That if you did not give, that you'd be like, oh, boy, what will I do with this money? I, I you know, boy, I just don't even need it. I can think of nothing else to do with this money. I have no, no one that wealthy who, is just wants, who just needs to burn up money. So everything is given sacrificially. So that as I look at the budget and look at what we spend, even on a copy machine, I want to make sure we get the right copy machine to take it seriously. Parking lots coming up 
And uh, I'll talk now. We met with, uh, opened the bids on it last week. The, the quote from the engineering firm was about $350,000. They said that's where the parking lot would sit. Last, I think it was last Tuesday, we opened up the sealed bids, five sealed bids, and we had three bids within $1,000 of each other. All right, now this is, I am told, unheard of in the bid process. The fourth, fourth bid was about $378,000. And the fifth bid was $400,000 and three bids right around the $350,000 mark. All right, and uh, I take it very seriously. This is not just, oh boy, $350,000. That's a whole chunk of money. That if, that if we do it wrong, it rests on my shoulders. I'm not going to blame anyone else. I'm not going to blame my wife. Not going to blame the deacons, though we met Sunday night, explained to the men where we're at and we're meeting with a company tomorrow and Lord willing, we believe this is the company we ought to sign with, and if the Lord lets us do that, it'd be tremendous. And if that's the case, how we've came to this partly this decision that uh, this company, look at these three companies. There was one company that could do the job in two months, and one that would do it in one month. Well, in our world, I like one month disruption better than two months. This company also happens to do something different with the curbs. We have some concrete curbs coming in. And uh, one company was going to do them by hand with forms. This company is planning on using, uh, hiring a firm that will do them with machines from Lansing. We'll get a better product. Well, if we can spend the same money and get a better product, I, I take it seriously. It seems to be a good investment. And, and so we're done trying to do our diligent do research. I take it seriously. Individually and corporately, I take seriously what we spend. When, we see, when you see something done around here, you may wonder, well, why why'd they do that? You can ask me. You can ask me, Pastor, why are you doing that? You know what? Why do you think that's necessary? And I typically... I would say always have an answer. Because, not because I make one up on the spot. <laughs> oh, I was sitting there in my office. I thought, huh, should we do the parking lot? Yes, heads. <laughs> oh, it's tails. Flip it again. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, you may not always like my answer. And the truth is, all of us spend money a little bit differently. Not, no two people in this room, even husband and wives, Spend money identically. There are some things that you would view important that I would view less important and vice versa. But my point is this, that I try to take it extremely seriously. That when you give money to, to First Baptist Church, of which I am ultimately steward, and I answer to God for that, I find that a little later on we look at the, the qualifications of a pastor. I'm supposed to be able to rule the house of God well. All right, that's one of the qualifications, and that involves a lot of it, the money part. I take it very seriously about that and, and uh, try to make decisions that would please the Lord. So if you have a question, you're welcome to come and ask me. Right? You ask the pastor, why, why are we doing this? And, and uh, I try to be transparent on that stuff. But I met with the deacons Sunday night, and they, they said, you know, that it's a good plan, and they seem to all be uh, in uh, some unanimous idea there that we're moving forward. And so we'll move forward, Lord willing, and uh, get this project rolling. Now, that does not mean... That does not mean that, that those who have committed in faith-building offering that we're done yet. All right? We're supposed to move forward. We can't last much longer in this parking lot. Either this winter, we've got to get this thing done. And as, uh, as we move forward, you finish your commitments. God will bless what's happening here. I read about uh, one article a day because current churches, new progressive churches, do not teach giving like you have heard your whole life, or if you've been your time here at First Baptist Church. I read an article on if your church is hurting for money as a pastor, how to raise more money in your church in the offering. You know what online they call clickbait? They give you a title you want to read? I clicked on it. <laughs> Eleven ways to make your offerings bigger. You ready for them? Number one. Get a revelation about money. Hmm. I'm going to spend some time in the prayer closet and get a revelation about money. They say, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm really shake my head in amazement. What? The only way to raise money, offering your church as a pastor, to get a revelation about money and come back with a revelation. I'm like, okay, well, that one's out. <laughs> Number two. Know what your church wants to hear. <laughs> now, 
this is done. I have heard it before. Not here. All right, in this current culture, Mo, uh, the younger generation wants to give to a cause, the GoFundMe culture. In fact, a different article when I was studying for the stewardship, I read about current trends, and I'll bring some of that. But they said that uh, millennials, not to pick up millennials, they say millennials give money every year to nonprofits, just not normally to church. And their point was, Pastor, listen, they're going to give money. you got to get it in your church. Now, let me tell you where I'm going completely with this. The fact is, if we obey God, giving's taken care of. But, but this is not about God yet. This is about manipulation, all right? So know what your church wants to hear. You know, oh, church, we're going to raise more money, and we're going to have a steak dinner for everybody on the stewardship banquet day in the afternoon service. Number three, let people know how to give. Now, not all this is all bad. You ought to be able to tell people this is how you give. Number four, cast a vision. Invite people to participate. Number six, use Scripture. Wow. Well, there she is. Use Scripture. I just have this strange thought as a teacher and minister of God's Word that maybe if we direct people to God's Word, everything else will be taken care of. All right, if I can get you to listen to God's Word, I can present God's Word. How about we do that for number one? All right, and then number two, we'll present the need. There are needs out there. So what we got to do. We come into Mission Month. We'll look at it, and I'll say, listen, church, and I'll say this in Missions Month. We are behind on our missions giving. Now, we're not behind in giving to missionaries. We make up all, this, all, all we need out of, out of the general fund. We do not shortchange our missionaries in any way, shape, or form. That's a commitment we made. But we're not pulling in enough in our missions giving that equals what we give out in missions. I'm happy to tell the need, and people want to give, they'll give. Here's one I enjoyed in the same list. Capture, this is in little quotes, capture the moment. Now, I'm reading this article today. At this point, I'm all in. All right, I am like engaged. Thoughts of tonight are off the table at this point. I'm, 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 like, I'm serious. I'm reading this. I'm like, wow. All right. Thoughts of the sermon, gone. I'm like, capture the moment. I had not, little, I had not read the descriptive paragraph yet, but I'm like, what does capture the moment mean? You know, I mean, what, what do you, capture the moment, right? Do you not want to capture the moment? I had to keep on reading. What choice did I have? Capture the moment. The moment. When people put that money in the plate. Capture that and let it resonate. You just feel better, do you? I mean, I feel a little, little chill when I'm down my spine. Capture that moment. What does that even mean? Express thankfulness. Thank you. <laughs> Give your visitors a pass, and I agree with that one. I often on Sundays, right, I will say that. If you're visiting here, do not feel any obligation to give in the offering. Right? Put people, I, I, I agree with that. Not all of it's bad. But my, probably one of my, one of my favorites, this last one right here. Prepare and practice. All right, practice taking an offering. Prepare for it. I never realized I had to do this. But now that I know this, I will. Apparently, these 11 ways will raise the offerings of First Baptist Church. So maybe this week, as soon as I finish studying for my sermon for Sunday, and I'm all done with that, I'll begin to prepare for offering. <laughs> maybe a good illustration. Huh? You know? Get, get some music to capture the moment. Bring a little revelation into it. Maybe if I have time, use Scripture, if it fits. Wow. Is that what we've resorted to in our churches? And that was a publication for pastors, for pastors on how to raise the offering in your church. We're in Stewardship Month. What I believe is that we will give truth from God's Word, all right? And people will choose then to respond to or to reject it. And I'll tell you what God says, what we're supposed to do. 
and then you have to, you have to make a choice then. Giving is a part, an element of a local church. Paul does say this, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Listen, friends, giving is investing. All right, when I give, I invest in the work of God. All right, one reason that we give is so that others may have and experience what we have and experience. You know, when you give, we're now able to fund the broadcast on television. Some people don't come to First Baptist Church, but they watch us. They watch us. I was stopped yesterday by someone who said, I watched, and this is what happened. And I made my children sit there, and boy, they were, they were excited to hear you. Never been to this church. You, you, and I made that possible as we gave. You know that when you give, we can print gospel tracts, right? So when you hand them out, someone who doesn't go here, who's never had Jesus Christ in their heart, can now have what you and I have. You and I made this possible. There's many people, there's many joining us online for each of our services. You know what? It costs money. And you and I and those who give, everyone who gives, makes that possible. And as we move forward, we want the church of God to grow, further the kingdom. And as, as we give, we can do more things to further the cause of Christ. Giving is investing. I would say it's the best money I've ever invested. I may see some things on this side. I may. I look at my life and I am blessed. I think recently, I think this past week, the last few days, the giving records went out. We got ours and I... Rejoice with my wife. Let's, let's look what God allowed us to do last year, First Baptist Church. Doreen and I, our family got to do. That money, what else would I have done with it? I don't know, but I know this. Nothing as important as what happened here at First Baptist Church. And I'm happy to give. It's, it's investing. And Paul said, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says. And if I sow bountifully, I'll reap also bountifully. I think we'll see some on this side. I look at my life now. I write blessings down every morning in my devotional journal. And I know, I know that I am blessed by God himself. All that I have, the, the toys that I don't need in my life, are not just accidental or coincidental. There's no doubt in my mind that God is blessed. But I am convinced in my heart that the temporal blessings we get now and God is kind and gracious to me and each one of us are nothing compared to when we get to eternity and we say, and he says, this is what I did with your two mites. You felt like it was a lot. It really, in his economy, is not that much. But he said, I took it and did something. Your little loaf, your little fish that you put in there faithfully. And you know this? I was going to say this for stewardship, but I found this out across all Christendom. People who give... Or people who make over $75,000 a year are less likely to give than people who make under $20,000 a year. In fact, it's like it, it is eight times easier if, you're, if you make under $20,000 to give. The more we're blessed financially, apparently the harder it is as Christians to part with it. May I and may you as a Christian hold these things loosely. Lord, I want to be a funnel. You give it to me, and I'll put it where you want it. All right? And along the way, he lets us reap and enjoy some of the benefits. Giving is investing, but giving is enjoyable. God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is a part of the local church. Next one on your, on your sheet there, fellowship. Acts chapter 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and, and prayers. What is this word Fellowship thrown around in our Baptist churches and, and churches, we want to have some fellowship. Fellowship there is friendly association, especially those who share the same interests. But there's biblical fellowship also on your sheet, a commitment to the church, the people, to be there, to care, to share, and to be aware. And the Bible says they continued steadfastly. 
Or in other words, they were diligent and devoted to this. Those three blanks are on your sheet. Being a part. Being a part. In biblical fellowship, we need to be a part. That means we're supposed to be around each other. Fellowship begins with being around. Second blank there, not only being a part, but having a part. Sharing. Serving. Biblical fellowship is not just about you making me feel good. It's about me having a part in this thing we call church. Being a part, having a part, and bearing a part. Burdens and needs. Another place in Scripture, Paul will equate or, or um, give an analogy of the church like a body. Everyone has a different part. In your body, you have eyes, ears, and nose, and knees, and everything does something different. Uh, you, you know, of course, your shins are great for walking around in the dark, and your eyes are tremendous for uh, picking up metal when you're cutting something, um, things like that. In a church, we all have a part. And sometimes, the part that you have is not the part you want. Well, I want to sing the solos. Well, no, Brother Mitchell, you pass the offering plate. <laughs> Bearing a part means I bear burdens and needs, and I take care of needs. I do my part. You see, sometimes the most important reason you come to church is not to hear me speak and preach and teach. It should be an integral part of the local church. I hope it's a help and a blessing to you, but sometimes... I believe the most important reason you're here is to help someone else. There have been times I've been at church and someone has said, Hey, Pastor, I'm praying for you. And that encouraged my heart beyond words. And if you're that person who can bear a burden and pray and meet needs, you can do your part. That is true biblical fellowship. You know, it's hard to give your computer a hug. You can get a hug at church. It's hard to have a conversation with your computer screen. You can have a conversation at church. Biblical fellowship. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You see, when you come to church, you're supposed to edify, build up. I'm thankful that we do that here at First Baptist Church. People say, well, I'm glad you're here. You know, it's not always the case in all churches. Sometimes more judgment goes on than edification. Oh. Oh, who do you think you are? Did you see what they're wearing today? Oh, well, this is what I heard about them. Listen, I hope that has no part at First Baptist Church. We call that gossip and slander. The Bible talks about that just like giving, and you can't line item veto that out of here. All right, if you had a problem with somebody, number one, shut your mouth. All right, and number two, open up this prayer and begin to pray for yourself. Well, they, they obviously need prayer. I don't know. I'm glad we've had people who have walked away from God and walked away from this church and come back and felt and felt judgment. Now, someone may have a guilty conscience at times, and I can't help that, but I pray to the God of heaven Someone who comes to First Baptist Church feels acceptance, love, and edification. Building up. And if there's a problem, all right, then go to the Lord first. If you have a question, come and ask me. Right? But don't just take it upon yourself to be the church police. Work on edifying. Now, I'm thankful to be a part that, of a church that... I have got tremendous testimony from people. They said, you know, I walk in the back doors, and I have never, quote, felt a more welcome place. I love that. I think it was Dave Young, evangelist, said um, once, he said, if your church all looks the same on a Sunday morning, something's not right. Right? That means, what it means is we have people growing. I've added to that statement. And if they look the same after a year, you're also not right. I think when God's word touches a heart, true change happens. Hey, we notice that all the time. And boy, all of a sudden, oh boy, I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow God in this way. Fellowship. I'll give you a little phrase about fellowship, and I'll end here tonight. 
Fellowship is not to take, but to give. And if you could understand this concept, you don't come to church to take. You come to give. Well, I don't have any friends at church. That's taking. Giving is, I'm going to go make some new friends at church. That's giving. Well, I don't like this. That's taking. I'm going to help this area that needs some help, and I can have an expertise in this. That's giving. Well, no one asked me how my day was. That's taking. I'm going to ask other people how their day was. That's giving. One time I had a good member of our church call, talk to this person, and they said, Pastor, how's your day going? Now, listen, I'm not saying that, so you ask me how my day is going. And they went on to say, you know what, I bet many people don't ask you that. And they said, you know, I think that's how, how you're doing. And I appreciate it. And I shared how I was doing. I shared, here's what I'm praying for. Here's my concerns and needs. And I, and I thanked this individual. So it touched my heart. Now, I'm not saying that you text me and say, how's your day going, all right? But we're all supposed to be giving in that way, not expectation of taking. But we know people, don't we, who complain because, well, no one said hi to me today. Well, who'd you say hi to? Who'd you talk to? Well, they walked right past me in the hallway and didn't talk to me. Well, who'd you walk past in the hallway? And just a reminder, if I walk past you in the hallway and I don't say something to you, it is personal. <laughs> I am upset with you. I probably don't ever want you to come to church here ever, ever, ever again. It was intentional. I planned it out. I prepared and practiced it just like my offering. I had a revelation. And you can take it to the bank and leave the church. That's how people react, is it not, though? And I, of course, am joking. All right? I'm obviously on a different track in my mind in that regard, and I walk right past you. And uh, don't take it personally. If it offended you, by all means, call me and say, Pastor, you walked past me. I was offended. And I will apologize. I am so sorry. I did not mean to offend you. Uh, but now that I know that, I will do my best not to do that again. And uh, no. Fellowship, not to take, but to give. All right, Lord, help us as we Lord, have this church that you've given to us that it would be the way you'd want it to be. And Lord, may we not be takers but givers. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.